Okay, good afternoon. Who knows who said this? So I felt it was appropriate. No, you, that's good only because I told you. So that's good. I felt it was appropriate that that should be extra credit on your next exam. Who thinks that's fair? Of course it's fair. You just go to Google and you look it up. <laughs> All right, so this is, this is actually said by Satchel Page. And he was, of course, referring to something else. But it's really the case of what happens when a cell is invaded by a virus. Cells have all these wonderful intrinsic mechanisms that they use to fight off various bacteria and uh, fungi and viruses. And yet, all of these organisms strive, they really work hard at it, to get beyond those defenses. And that's what we're going to talk about today. In a lot of contexts, covering a lot of ground and some things that you know and hopefully a few things that you don't know so that there's some new material here. So the question, of course, is what does one do to the other? And the host, as we have said, is there in principle to avoid being infected. After all, infection is not something that you really want. On the other hand, sometimes there are benefits from being infected, believe it or not. But the viruses and other uh, organisms really want to get through that. And their main objective is to replicate. So it's a battle whoops, of evolutionary strategies that have evolved between hosts and various organisms. As you look from the most primitive organisms, like worms, all the way up um, to humans, if we are the most evolved, uh, we find that there are different ways of dealing with pathogens. And so we have primitive innate immune responses in some of the very lower uh, organisms. And we carry these through from Drosophila to man in terms of the toll-like receptors that Dr. Racaniello told you about. And we have adaptive cell responses to infection. And these include both B cells that make antibodies, form your humoral immune system, and T cells, which directly target um, infected cells, process antigens, release cytokines, and control much of what goes on in terms of the adaptive response. For the virus, the goal is to survive, to reproduce, and then just to get the hell out of there and go find somebody else to infect. All right? So that's where we are. How do you do this? Well, a great way of doing it is to overwhelm the host. But as it turns out, that's not easy. And for the most part, it's only infections, infections only occur at relatively low multiplicities of infection. So you don't get infected with thousands and millions of particles unless somebody sneezes directly on you. Viruses seek to enter parentally, and that's any other way than the gut. And the reason for that is the gut's really a nasty place to be. Um, you've got to go through the stomach. You've got to go through a very acidic environment. You go into the small intestine, and it's full of other microorganisms. It's full of some wonderful um, immune cells that recognize pathogens and take things out. It's coated with mucus. And so it's uh, a tough way to start. It's much easier to enter through the bloodstream, through the lungs. And the first thing that these viruses want to do is to disarm the host. Well, you saw this slide two days ago, two lectures ago, recently. And what I want to emphasize is the course of virus growth during an acute infection and how the host plays a role in this. So we have the virus entering the host, and that's the establishment of infection, getting in, finding a cell in which it can replicate. That immediately triggers all of the innate immune system, all of those little molecules that are both extrinsic, sitting on the outside of the cell, and intrinsic, sitting inside the cells. And they respond, and they get cells to produce various cytokines, and they cause mobilization of uh, macrophages, and they eat up all the virus and you survive. But not always. And sometimes what happens is the virus continues to replicate, and sometimes it replicates in these cells that are attacking um, infected cells. So we get the induction of the adaptive response. 
and the adaptive immune response is a two-component system, both cellular and humoral, with the humoral system actually taking quite a long time. And in fact, you don't usually see the adaptive response in terms of the outcome until symptoms have developed. So all this while, you're not sick, but you're going to be. And the question then becomes, when do you treat a viral infection? And the answer is, of course, somewhere in this period before things go crazy. Anyways, we have this adaptive response, and that usually goes towards clearing the virus, except in some exceptional cases. And we'll talk about, that, about those next week, or maybe it's the week after. And then you're left with memory cells. And the memory cells are there to recapitulate whatever happened the first time, but to respond more rapidly. So, how does the virus invade all of these different components of the immune system? And when I talk about immunity now, I'm not talking just about B cells and T cells. I'll be talking about some of the intrinsic molecules and the pathways that are <coughs> elaborated in response to infection. Well, you, you want to disarm the innate immune system. One of the choice ways that viruses have uh, evolved to deal with uh, evasion is to regulate major, histo major histocompatibility complex molecules. And these MHC molecules are responsible for antigen presentation. And they come in a couple of flavors, MHC1 and MHC2. And then they, uh, these activities occur in different cell types. The other thing that viruses can do is inter interfere with cytotoxic T cells and with natural killer cells. And they find ways to regulate these cells, fool them, essentially, because they're much smarter than the cells are. And effectively what happens is these cells don't do their job. They don't lyse infected cells. They can alter antigen presentation in any number of ways, and we'll talk about that in a great more detail towards the end of the lecture. And finally, they can go and hide. After all, if somebody's running after you, and they're bigger than you, you want to go and hide, right? It's a way to get out of it. And we'll talk about that later again. So persistence and latency is a great way for viruses to go away and come back and annoy you at some later date. So what are the host defenses? Um, the immune system. And it recognizes signals, signals that are present on virus molecules, viral antigens that are presented uh, to the system, by macrophages, by dendritic cells, by various T cells. And its purpose is to not just recognize the signal, but to amplify the signal. More is better. More allows for a response. Okay? And when you have an amplified signal, you have the opportunity to control the invader in one way, shape, or form. The innate immune system I say responds to everything. Well, it doesn't really respond to everything, but it responds to very many components of viruses. And Dr. Rackin Yellow has introduced uh, these to you. I talked, when I talked about DNA replication and transcription, I talked about nuclear molecules that form components within the nucleus. And these internuclear <coughs> modulatory molecules are responsible for changing the ability of viruses to establish infection. And some of them turn out to be ISGs. So they're interferon-stimulated genes. And some of them will actually, interfer will actually um, induce interferon in a different way. We have the interferons that induce an antiviral state. We have the protein kinase R, which phosphorylates EIF2-alpha and stops translation, thereby abrogating virus infection. Our bodies are full of complement, and when complement is activated in the presence of immunoglobulin, it'll punch holes in membranes, kill cells that are infected. As I said before, we have the natural killers and the cytotoxic T lymphocytes, and we have macrophages and neutrophils. So there's a whole armamentarium of different weapons that the body presents to anything that invades, and it's an obstacle course, and you've got to get through it. And pathogens are very good at it. The adaptive immune response is a memory response. That is, <clears throat> you have a response, and that remains with you. 
hopefully for your whole life. It's activated in response to the innate immune response. So the primary response, the innate immune response, results in the release of cytokines. It stimulates cells. It gets them activated. It lets them see molecules. It draws cells to the site of infection. This results in the full expansion of B cells and T cells. And for this, these two events to occur, it requires Th1 and Th2 cells. And these cells, T lymphocytes, all CD4 positive cells, release certain cytokines that activate B cells and T cells to expand. And we also have the generation of the cytotoxic T cells and antibody production. So we have the humoral, the arm, the humoral arm of response and uh, the cellular arm. We also have just regular old inflammatory responses, those reddened areas, except they occur, occur inside. And that occurs in response to necrosis, cell death. Virus gets in, it replicates, it kills the cell in which it's replicating. As a result of that, frequently what you do is you release cytokines and chemokines. And if you don't release them, you draw cells that see these new uh, foreign antigens on the surface to the infected site, and they will release them. And their purpose is to recruit neutrophils and macrophages to the site of damage, and they are essentially cells that are garbage cans, and they'll eat anything that's in their pathway, and hopefully that results in uh, destruction of the cell and the virus that's in it. Sometimes, however, it results in infection of the neutrophil and the macrophage because the virus has gone far enough along, it's intact, it's an easy entry into the cell, and it has an opportunity to replicate. As I said, the cytokines are the primary output of the innate immune response, and depending upon which toll receptor is tickled, you get a different family of uh, cytokines induced. It's a great response because it's rapid. And as soon as something hits, begins to replicate, leaves a trail or a trace, these guys are made. They control inflammation, although too much of them can start inflammation. So you've heard of cytokine storms, perhaps, which are hugely over uh, synthesis of cytokines, which generally lead to organ failure and death. Cytokines induce the antiviral state, and interferons are the main culprit in that, and they regulate the immune system. So what does the virus do? The virus is smart. It makes virokines. And these guys, for all the world, look like, feel like, smell like, in fact, act like normal chemokines. And these mimetics are faithful enough so that they bind to the appropriate receptor and sequester those receptors, but they don't activate them. So they fit, but not quite right. And then we have viral receptors. And these are also elaborated by a variety of viruses. And these are soluble cytokine receptors. So you've got an infected cell, you've got an infected organ. <clears throat> the virus elaborates this receptor. It goes out into the cytoplasm. It captures all the raging cytokines, sequesters them, and they don't get a chance to do what they want to do. So you abrogate initiation of the response. So what we can do is we can sabotage both innate and adaptive defense without affecting growth in cell culture because most of these molecules are not made in cell culture. The interferons are, but most of the receptors and the T cells and whatever are not present, so viruses will replicate in cell culture because they can get through um, these responses. Now, interferon is, comes in a variety of flavors, four that we know about, maybe more, and the virus has to counter the effects of interferon. And the reason is pretty simple. Without interferon, the host has a reduced ability to contain viral infections. So infections spread rapidly. You lose that rapidly acting arm of the innate immune system. Viruses do it in a variety of ways. It turns out that we have viruses that make double-stranded RNA binding proteins. So the NS1 protein from influenza, the E3H protein from pox viruses, US11 from herpes simplex virus. These are proteins that actually bind double-stranded RNA. Uh, 
and so it's not seen by the rig eye si signaling system. Adenovirus elaborates a very small double-stranded RNA that's made in enormous amounts. And that double-stranded RNA acts as a decoy that binds protein kinase R. When you bind it, you take it out of, um, out of the pathway for inhibiting translation. So here we have a list. Don't memorize it, OK? And the idea here is just to show you the wide variety of ways in which viruses make products that attack various arms of the interferon response. So they can inhibit interferon synthesis. And we do it in a couple of ways. We can regulate double-stranded RNA production. We can block host protein synthesis. That's a rather brutal way to do that. Or we have homologs that inhibit production of interferons, such as IL-10 by the Epstein-Barr virus. We also have interferon receptor decoys. Again, soaking up the soluble chemokine, preventing it from doing what it should do. You can inhibit signaling of interferon, either by decreasing the amount of STAT that's present in that cellular membrane at the, uh, the JAK STAT receptors. You can actually interfere with phosphorylation of STATs. You can block proteins with which they interact. And that prevents the signaling pathway. And then you can block the function of interferon-induced proteins. And what we know is that there are hundreds of these. What we don't know is what most of them do. So that's an open question in terms of what else there is to look at. But we have things such as a PKR decoy. We have molecules that bind double-stranded RNA and PKR. We have molecules that block the action of specific um, ISGs. And all of these are different ways that viruses choose or have adapted or have evolved to abrogate the interferon response. Now, some of the regulators of ISGs. Again, we come back to these nuclear domain tens that are composed of host proteins. And these host proteins have a role in repressing virus replication. And they form the innate nuclear defense. So not only do we have cytoplasm, not only do we have um, proteins at the cell surface and proteins in the cytoplasm, but we have proteins in the nucleus whose purpose is to effectively um, prevent the virus from replicating. And this results in sort of an epigenetic regulation of virus replication. It's not direct. What it's doing is taking away something. It's taking away a replication compartment, not allowing the virus to establish itself. And the promyelocytic leukemia protein, PML, is an important ND10 constituent. And that happens to be degraded by some viral proteins. And in particular, herpes simplex virus and its very close um, relative, varicella zoster virus. I'm never going to get this right anyway. OK. OK. Um, both replicate in the nucleus. Both establish replication compartments that are part of ND10s. But in one case, they attack PML. And in the other case, they don't. So here's a picture of that. Here's a cell infected with herpes simplex virus. The red represents a protein called ICP0. And here's a cell infected with varicella zoster virus. And the red rep represents ORF61P. And these proteins are very, very similar. They're orthologs. And yet the simplex virus protein results in the complete loss of PML. So look at this. Here's our ICP0. Here's our no PML. And here's the cell that's expressing both. So here's an uninfected cell, and here's an infected cell. And we don't see the little green dots. However, it's different for varicella zoster. Here's the orthologous protein, 61P. And you'll see that PML persists in these cells. So viruses that have evolutionarily conserved proteins can have different functions. Another way in which um, the host seeks to um, abort virus infection is to regulate translation. And viruses, again, seek to alter that fate. And they want to modify the host to fade the synthesis of their own proteins so that their own messenger RNAs are being used. We've heard about cap-independent um, translation. We've heard about irises. 
And there are yet other ways in which viruses attack this um, innate system. And that's to change the way in which uh, protein synthesis occurs, in which various mRNAs are seen. So interferon establishes the antiviral state. It induces PKR and other EIF2 alpha kinases. And remember that those are important proteins for initiation of translation. So when you do that, you inhibit translation. And what are the consequences for virus replication? Well, a virus that's in a cell that can't produce protein is not going to survive forever. Messenger RNAs have some sort of a finite half-life. The genomes are present either in the cytoplasm or the nucleus and can persist only for a certain period of time unless they can go latent. And eventually, under those conditions, the cell will win out. So <clears throat> PKR is activated by binding double-stranded RNA. When that happens, it autophosphorylates itself at a serine 51 uh, residue. And once that occurs, it's able, the activated PKR is able to phosphorylate EF, EIF out to alpha. When phosphorylated, it forms a very tight ternary complex with GDP bound EIF2 beta, and that blocks recycling of the initiation complex, and translation is arrested. But viruses have evolved ways to thwart these antivirus defenses. And here are a couple of examples. So for example, there's a protein that's elaborated by herpes simplex virus called US11. And this protein actually binds to PKR. So it prevents it from doing what it should do, which is phosphorylate its target. It also prevents it from being activated. The adenovirus VA RNAs that I told you about briefly before, inhibit by binding tightly to PKR, and that's a double-stranded DNA decoy. There are hundreds of thousands of these molecules inside of an infected cell, so it's a very efficient way of blocking the host response. And then a protein from human papillomavirus called E6, which is an important protein in regulating papillomavirus replication, and a very bizarre little protein made in herpes simplex virus infected cells gamma because it's a very late gene, and 34.5 because obviously it was between 34 and 35, dephosphorylate EIF to alpha. And the, one of them, we know the mechanism, that's 34.5 interacts with uh, protein phosphatase 1 and redirects it to EIF to alpha. And that's all pretty much summarized on this next slide. You can see that in the normal course of activation of EIF2 alpha, you have the GDP bound form, it interacts with EIF2B, and then it goes through this cycle interacting with tRNA um, and starting the initiation complex. US11, a protein, adenovirus VA RNAs prevent activation. These guys prevent the movement of these molecules into a functional EIF2B complex by phosphorylating EIF2-alpha. When you phosphorylate this guy, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, um, this is the natural pathway of PKR, and, and it will phosphorylate this guy in response to virus infection. And now you get a ternary complex, which really is extremely stable, so it can't recycle. What happens with these guys is they prevent the phosphorylation or they actually have the phosphate removed after induction of another protein so that you don't form this complex and translation continues. How do you modulate interferon? There are lots of ways of doing it. One is you can inhibit interferon synthesis. And if you're effectively um, blocking translation, you're inhibiting synthesis of interferon and just about everything else. Um, you can synthesize a decoy or bring a decoy in that will sequester interferon so that it doesn't get out of the cell or when it comes and it is out of the cell, it doesn't enter another cell. You can inhibit interferon signaling using these uh, viral receptors or you can block the function of interferon stimulated genes such as PKR. <clears throat> 
another method that the cell uses or the host uses to escape infection leads to cell death, and that's apoptosis. So a virus comes into a cell, and the cell sees the virus, and it sees this is not a good thing, and it wants to respond. And what it does is it sacrifices itself, and it dies. But it dies in a very characteristic way. And um, the host escape mechanism that leads to cell death results in inflammation by cysteine proteases, known as caspases. You also see induction of cytokines in response to what's elaborated by the infected cell that's dying. And the infected cells release proteins that are subsequently presented by MHC2. So when those proteins are gobbled up by lymphocytes in the cell or macrophages, they are then degraded into linear epitopes and presented on the surface of cells by MHC2. And finally, it results in activation of cytotoxic T cells. So this sacrifice, this cell dying, helps to save the organ or, uh, or the organism by activating the immune response. The host controls induction and suppression. And it does it through a family of molec molecules known as either BCL2 or Baxin bad the BCL2 family members are anti-apoptotic. So it's the normal state of the cell not to kill itself. It's a good way to be. All right? And the BCL2 family members block translocation of pro-apoptotic molecules to the mitochondria. And when these pro-apoptotic molecules get to the mitochondria or to the endoplasmic reticulum, they result in the release of proteins and calcium molecules that perturb the cells and cause massive chaos inside the cell. Bax and BAD are proapoptotic molecules. In fact, they form an oligomer, one Bax, one BAD, and there are other members of these families that can um, be part of this party. And when they get together, they'll cause an induction of a caspase cascade and the release of cytochrome C from the mitochondria. So this is the intrinsic death receptor pathway. And here on the top, we have our BCL2 members. Here are backs and back, back. One of those should be bad, but uh, here it is. And there are other component members. And when these two guys are together, they will um, lodge into the membranes of either mitochondria or ER and release molecules. If you have enough BCL2 or one of its homologs, they will replace or prevent the oligomerization, and you don't see release of these molecules. Release of these molecules, including cytochrome C, caspase 9, and APF1, causes the formation of something called an apoptosome, which is a large structure inside of a cell which is composed of these proteins that oligomerize, and they essentially activate effector caspases that leave to lead to apoptosis. <clears throat> There's also an extrinsic pathway. And here you see activation of caspases as a result of ligands, very specific ligands such as tumor necrosis factor, FAS, APO2D trail, interacting with receptors on cell surfaces that release caspases into the cytoplasm. So you can do it from the inside of the cell and you can do it from the outside of the cell. The effect is the same the cell apoptosis. What are some of the characteristics of apoptosis? Cell organelles are dismantled. They really come apart. The entire cell dissolves. Vesicles form, and membranes on the outside of the cell actually begin to bleb. So you look like, um, sort of like the Pillsbury Doughboy. There are lots of little blobs that are on the surface of the cell. DNA is cleaved. So it's an event that transcends not just the cytoplasm, also goes into the nucleus. So what's that? It's telling you is that endonucleases are released and the DNA of the chromosome is being destroyed. And strange molecules are placed on the cell surface. And those happen to be markers for apoptosis. So if you look at it, this is what happens. The normal cell, in response to some sort of signal, begins to apoptose. Its cell architecture changes. It begins to release these vacuoles these apoptotic bodies, the nucleus goes to hell, chromosomes condense, 
they get chewed up by endonucleases, and lo and behold, the macrophage comes along and cleans up the mess. But in doing so, the macrophage has now been signaled that something bad is going on in this cell. And what's bad is the virus infection has happened. Now, if you block apoptosis, you allow the virus to finish its infectious cycle. So what you have is a battle between the virus and the host. Who can win? Who can get there first? Who can do their business before the other one? So let's just take a quick look at some of the characteristics of apoptosis. And these are cells that are infected with uh, a mutant of herpes simplex virus. And the reason for that is that the wild type virus um, suppresses apoptosis. But when you delete the gene that's involved in suppressing apoptosis, you see that even very early after infection, strange structures form on the surface of cells. And these are the blebs that are characteristic of apoptosis. And if you look inside the cell, you'll see all of these vacuoles that are lining the cytoplasm. So membrane blebbing and apoptotic body formation, these vesicles that get shoved off and get eaten up by the macrophages, are part and parcel of apoptosis. Another thing that occurs during apoptosis is that certain um, proteins are cleaved. And cleavage of these proteins results in apoptosis-inducing uh, signals. Among those proteins are something called PARP, or polyADP ribose polymerase, DNA fragmentation factor, and caspase-3. And once again, we're going to compare what happens in a wild-type cell with what happens in a mutant cell. And you can see this product, 85, accumulates in mutant cells, but not until very late times after infection in wild-type cells. So the wild-type cell prevents the cleavage of that guy and this guy and caspase-3, whereas the mutant, which doesn't have the anti-apoptotic activity, allows cleavage of PARP, allows cleavage of DNA fragmentation factor, and allows cleavage of caspase-3, and as a result of that, the cell apoptosis. That's not good for the virus. The virus suffers. Here we see a picture of the same kind of events occurring with DNA fragmentation. This is a um, agarose gel in which DNA is loaded at the top, right over here, and then it's electrophoresis down through. And you can see that the size of the DNA in the wild-type infected cells is different from what's present in the mutant cells. In fact, there are la little ladders that look, how many of you know what nucleosomes are? Everybody, please raise your hand. OK. So that look like nucleosome ladders, very discrete cuts that occur in the DNA. And that's because the DNA is being fragmented. So why block apoptosis? Well, after infection, cells are activated in response to, uh, to the virus. And what you do is you frequently activate quiescent cell machinery at the wrong time in the cell cycle. So when we talked about DNA replication, we talked about the fact that DNA viruses frequently use something from the host, but not all host cells are in the process of DNA replication. As a result of that, they induce these proteins. They induce these cycles, and they activate quiescent cell machinery. When things are made at the wrong time, checkpoint control signals respond. Checkpoints are normal cell constituents that are there to control how a cell moves through its replication cycle. The virus responds to complete replication. And why? Because if you fail, you get decreased yields. Now, if you apoptose, you're going to release virus antigens. So you want to inhibit the release of virus antigens so that the virus can effectively hide from the cells, from the host. And it does that by eliminating T cell activation and by evading the immune response. All those are good for the virus, bad for you. Here's a simple slide which um, diagrams about 100 different virus proteins that are involved in attacking every single point in the process of apoptosis. And what you should take from this is that it's a complicated process. I made all the letters really small so you can't read any of them. But what you want to think about is the fact that apoptosis can be blocked from the cell surface, at the cell surface, through the signaling components, 
by blocking or by scavenging free radicals, which are also inducers of apoptosis, by inhibiting the release of caspases from mitochondria or cytochrome C, by inhibiting transcription of ISGs and other factors, other proteins that are involved in starting the apoptosis mechanism. So evolution selects, viruses make the minimal number of proteins that they need to get where they are, and they succeed sometimes. So here are a couple of examples of, uh, from that previous slide. And it's interesting to note that a non-coding RNA from human cytomegalovirus can bind a protein in the mitochondria, just like VARNA binds PKR. And that protein normally triggers apoptosis. But if it's bound by this RNA, it's not free to do that. Adenovirus makes an early protein called E1B, and that binds BACs. When you bind BACs, you take it out of its pro-apoptotic pathway, and that prevents caspase activation. That's the intrinsic pathway. Adeno makes another protein, E3, which blocks the death receptor, FAS. And so you no longer can induce apoptosis, and that works extrinsically. So there are many different ways in which you can get around the problem. Now, another protein that uh, cells make and uh, is interesting in its own right is a protein called ApoBec. ApoBec was discovered about 10 years ago, and it's a protein family whose sole purpose, well, maybe not sole purpose, its function is to edit RNA. And it's an interferon-induced um, <coughs> protein. And what it does is it deaminates cytidine to uridine, uridylate, actually. And that's an intrinsic antiviral. And it's able to block the replication of HIV, hepatitis B virus, and measles virus. So these guys, as you will recognize from what Dr. Rackin Yellow has told you, is replicate in very different ways. Yet they're all effectively inhibited by ApoBec. Interestingly, this protein is incorporated into HIV virus particles. So if the protein is in the virus particle, is the host a step ahead? The HIV epidemic would tell you that the host is not a step ahead. Okay, and in fact, what the virus does is it makes another protein called NEF, which interferes with ApoBec. So how does Ap ApoBec inhibit HIV replication? What it does, I told you it was uh, an RNA-directed molecule, but it also works on single-stranded DNA. And what it does is it attacks Cs in minus-strand DNA and deaminates them. This C to U transition results in the change from GC base pairs to AT base pairs. And if you have a codon such as one for tryptophan and you change those GC pairs to AT, you become a stop codon. So you make lots of premature proteins. U containing DNA, as it turns out, is also attacked by an enzyme in cells called uh, uracil DNA glycosidase. And that cleaves A basic sites and, it, I'm sorry, it generates A basic sites, so it removes the base. Those are recognized by endonucleases, and the DNA is cleaved. So that first product of reverse transcription is taken out of the loop. So how does HIV survive ApoBec? It survives because of this protein, VIF. I told you it was NEF, but it's VIF, which is incorporated also in the virion. And VIF interacts in a species-specific manner to bind ApoBec and target it to the protein. Proteasome. The prote in the proteasome, the protein gets chewed up. Now, the species specificity is an interesting problem. And if you substitute human with murine, then VIF doesn't work because it doesn't recognize that apobec. So the virus goes on and survives in that case. Now for immune modulation. One of the first responses after um, the innate immune response is that of dendritic cells. And dendritic cells come to scoop up the mess and clean things up and present antigens and recognize sites of inflammation. And they're very often compromised by virus infection. 
And once you compromise those, the ones that start the immune response, then what you get effectively is suppression of the immune response. And it can occur as a result of interference with recruitment. So you don't bring dendritic cells to the site of infection. There's signals that are required to get them there are lost. Impairment of antigen uptake, so they don't take up the proteins. Or even processing of these proteins elaborated by the virus. If you don't pro process the proteins that are taken up, you don't process the virus fragments, then you don't present anything to the immune system. And then things just remain hidden. You can interfere with maturation of dendritic cells. In order for them to present antigen, they have to mature. You can uh, interfere with their ability to migrate to lymphoid tissue, where they present antigen to various T cells. And you can interfere with the failure with their ability to activate T cells. So these, excuse me, are all different ways in which dendritic cells can be compromised as a result of elaboration of various virus proteins. Natural killer cells, T cells, effectively recognize and survey the body looking for target cells that are elaborating uh, certain molecules. Natural killer cells have no antigen receptors, but they have two other receptors. There's an inhibitory receptor, and that inhibitory receptor recognizes cells that produce MHC1 and whose MHC1 is loaded with peptide. So those are antigen-producing cells. There's another receptor on the uh, NK cell, and that's the activating receptor. And that recognizes um, a protein on the surface of a target cell in the absence of this or in somehow when this is interfered with. The inhibitory receptor is much stronger than the activating receptor. And that's probably a good thing. You don't want to activate NK cells all the time. So properties of NK cells, they have no antigen receptors per se. They secrete cytokines. Again, so you see cytokines over and over again in every aspect of the immune response. They kill cells that lack MHC1 on the surface by recognizing missing self. If it ain't there, it's dead. It's a target. And it's not there for certain reasons. Antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity involves NK cells binding to immunoglobulin-coated cells. And when they see that, it results in the release of perforins and granzymes into the target cell and that triggers apoptosis. Now, how does a virus modulate NK cells? Well, some viruses actually express MHC1 homologs. So they look just like what they should look like on the cell surface. And that activates the inhibitory receptor, keeps them from triggering the NK cell. They regulate MHC. They regulate its transcription, and in some cases, its translation and in some cases where it goes inside the cell in an incredible dance of molecules that occurs throughout uh, the infected cell and in normal cells. They can release virus-encoded cytokine binding proteins back to virus receptors, and they can block engagement of the activating receptor. They can also be antagonists of the activating receptor. Keep everything down on the farm. Don't let the serfs have an uprising. Get Gaddafi before he gets to Benghazi. Um, infection of NK cells can lead to disruption of function or to cell death. So the virus gets into the NK cell, can kill the cell. <clears throat> so here's a schematic of everything that I've just illustrated to you. The viruses that have MHC class 1 homologs are seen by the NK cell, and they activate the inhibitory receptor. Nothing happens. Sometimes the viruses reduce the synthesis of MHC, but allow the synthesis of another HLA-like molecule that sort of mimics MHC. So MHC is gone, but this guy looks a lot like it, enough like it so that it engages the inhibitory receptor and prevents the NK cell from being activated. There are, ac oops. There are activating receptor antagonists, which are made by infected cells, which bind to the activating receptor and prevent it from activating the NK cell. Um, there are viral, viral receptors, 
which are elaborated by these cells, which can bind to cytokines or chemokines and prevent stimulation of the NK cell. And then there are cytokines and chemokines that act as agonists to bind to cytokine receptors and prevent that activity. And finally, you have the ability sometimes of the virus to actually be taken up by the inhibitory receptor and get into the cell, infect it, kill it, and therefore lower the response. Here are a couple of clever ways in which um, virus proteins effectively abrogate the NK response. Hepatitis C makes an envelope protein, so it's on the surface of the virus, E2, that binds to the activating receptor, CD81 on NK cells, and it blocks activation. Therefore, they don't recognize infected cells. HIV makes a small protein called NEF, and that affects cell surface expression of some MHC molecules, but not the HLA-E molecule. The cell is still protected. Pox viruses express proteins that bind IL-12, and that inhibits interferon gamma production by NK cells. NK cells are the primary producers of interferon gamma. So you have different ways of affecting what the NK cell can do when it sees its target. On to adaptive immunity and, and the responses that are affected, both at the humoral level and the cell-mediated level. So cell-mediated immunity, immunity, T cell condition, is uh, mediated by membrane-bound antigen on B cells and or the T cell receptor. It occurs in response to antigen that's presented by MHC1 on all cells or by MHC2 on macrophages or dendritic cells. So we know that T helper and cytolytic T cells, CD4 and CD8 cells, have these T cell receptors on them to recognize different molecules, and that the B cells have antibody receptors on them, and that all these guys are binding antigen. The B cells as linear epitopes, bigger chunks, the T cells as peptides that are presented in the context of MHC. And the one thing that's in common between all these different mechanisms is that binding releases cytokines. And that results in stimulation of cell division, clonal expansion. More guys to fight the battle. It's important to note that CD4TH cells differentiate into both TH1 and TH2 cells, and that just means they elaborate different cytokines, and they effectively um, control uh, the propagation either of the humoral response or the CD8 response. Th1 cells release interleukin-1 and interferon gamma, and Th2 cells release IL-4, 6, and 10, and they promote the antibody response. Now, what are the effects of stimulating cell division? So you have an antigen, you see it, and the cell responds, it responds by dividing, by proliferating. You get clonal expansion, as I said before, increases the number of cell responders. T cells kill cells bearing foreign peptide or protein. CD4 positive T helpers recognize MHC class II molecules and peptides that are bound by them, the linear repitopes. CD8 uh, T cells recognize MHC1 bound peptides smaller, nine or 11 amino acid peptides, I can't remember. And in response to cytokines from Th1 cells, CD8 cells become mature cytotoxic T cells. So they go out and they search and they kill. In response to the cytokines from the Th2 cells, CD4 guys, B cells synthesize antibody and they become a plasma cell. Again, you're expanding the number of cells that can uh, produce antibody. You increase the humoral response and you have the ability to fight the infection. The B cell can also become a memory cell, sitting in your body for 40 or 50 years, waiting to be infected again, or in some cases, a little bit more often, and respond with a rapid uh, humor response. What do these cells look like? They look just like this, okay? The major, the major difference between CD4 and CD8 cells is the engagement of the T cell receptor on these cells. They share other uh, 
membrane proteins, and these proteins are there to recognize partners on target cells. And the CD4 cell recognizes peptide, as presented by MHC2, and the CD8 cell recognizes peptide, as presented by MHC1. So you have two signal systems. You have these MHC molecules and their accessory molecules and their ligands. And when these things are engaged, what they do is they lead to T cell activation. So you lead to clonal expansion, you lead to proliferation of cells, you recruit the army, everybody gets drafted. Just to recapitulate for you, here's our vertebrate body. We have hu the humeral response arm and the cell-mediated response arm. From the bone marrow, we have naive T cells, which can be educated in the thymus to become CD4 or CD8 cells, T helper or CTL precursors. The CD8 arm recognizes antigen as presented by MHC1, CD4 by C uh, MHC2. When the CD4 cell is activated, it can either release Th1 cytokines if it becomes a Th1 cell. That stimulates um, maturation of CTLs and gets them to their point where they can recognize infected cells. And if they're Th2 and they're releasing Th2 cytokines, it stimulates B cells to become plasma cells and secrete antibody. So those are receptor molecules, and what they do is they engage, um, they, well, they engage various molecules that allow them to be differentiated into. So cells are first CD8, CD4 positive. They're double positives um, before they go into the thymus. And then they get selected. And on the basis of that, these molecules allow them or change the ability of these cells to produce various cytokines. So CD4 cells, for example, uh, are the hosts for HIV, not CD8s. And CD4 is one of the molecules that's part of the HIV receptor complex. So what you're essentially doing is you're getting out cells that have different functions, derived from the same cell type, but because of species, well, let's call it speciation, I don't know what else to call it, or maturation in the thymus, they become either CD4 positive or CD8, and those receptors on the surface of the cell, CD8 and CD4, are seen by various molecules on activated cells um, and provide a variety of functions. So how does the virus attack the T cell response? Different viruses do it in different ways. Epstein-Barr virus, a herpes virus that all of you have, or if you don't, you will, encodes an IL-10 homolog that suppresses the Th1 response. Suppress, suppress the Th1 response, you spare infected B cells, as it turns out. KSHV, your more recently discovered herpes virus, responsible for Kaposi sarcoma, elaborates a horde of virokines. It's as though it went into the host, it picked up five, six, seven genes that are normally ISGs, captured, <coughs> captured them, and provided a permanent refuge for them in its own genome. And it releases these virokines, and they inhibit immune surveillance. They glom up, <coughs> they glom up all the receptors and prevent um, immune cells from seeing infected cells. Now, um, the last major topic, not quite the last, but almost the last topic, that I want to talk about today is MHC1 presentation. And it's important because we've figured out most of how antigen is presented to the cell surface by recognizing how viruses screw the system up. And it's a wonderfully complicated system. And it begins with the synthesis of a molecule called MHC1 heavy chain and it gets synthesized on the ribosome. It uses the uh, SEC61 protein apparatus to get moved into the ER. And here it interacts with a host chaperone called BIP and another protein called CNX, and it forms this complex. 
this complex moves along the wall of uh, the ER and it gains uh, another protein called beta-2 microglobulin. MHC is always seen with its partner, beta-2 microglobulin. And it gets another protein called um, HC. Loses one, gets one, gets another one, CRT, until finally it moves to a region where, um, which we call the peptide loading complex. The peptide loading complex is primarily compo composed of two proteins the TAPs, maybe three, so TAP1 and TAP2, antigen presenter, and TAPASIN, another small molecule that sits inside the ER. The TAPs span the ER, and they essentially form a pore. And the purpose of this pore is to accept peptides that are released from the 26S proteasome machinery. So, Proteins that are in the cell that are targeted for degradation, either a result of ubiquitination or some other process, get loaded by TAP in an ATP-dependent fashion and presented to the peptide loading complex in the context of tapasin. What happens then is that these MHC molecules move across until they find an ER exit site. They lose everything except the uh, beta-2 microglobulin and the MHC and the peptide, and they get spit out into COP2 vesicles and get placed onto the surface of cells. Sometimes the MHC molecules get spit out without anything. When they get spit out without anything, they get degraded. So they're targeted for degradation. If you don't have peptide, you're not taking the right course, you're not following the prescribed um, exit pathway from the cell, and you pay for it. Virus proteins interfere with MHC1-mediated antigen presentation. And as you can see from this, there are a lot of targets. There are a lot of different ways in which a virus can effectively shut the host down. And let's take a look at them. So there's a little tiny protein called ICP-47. It's 12 kilodaltons. It's made by herpes simplex virus. And it sits right here. So it's the new sentinel for um, essentially effectively preventing peptides from entering the antigen presentation mechanism. It actually physically blocks um, antigen presentation. And as a result of that, ICP-47, which remains uh, attached to the ER, effectively prevents peptide presentation. Adenovirus E19 does it another way. So the viral molecules are in the gray. And what it does is it blocks the interaction of MHC1 with tapasin. And when that happens, you exclude peptide from loading in the complex. And it can't get in there, and that MHC gets shot out, and it gets degraded. Nothing gets presented on the cell surface. HCMV makes a protein called US6, human cytomegalovirus. And US6 actually sits inside uh, the ER, and it has a luminal surface, one inside, and a cytoplasmic domain, one outside. And the cytoplasmic domain binds uh, ATP, um, and it prevents ATP binding to TAP. And that prevents peptide loading. Remember, I told you this was an ATP-dependent process. If you don't generate energy, you don't get the peptide into um, the ER. EBV makes a protein called BNLF2A, and I certainly don't want you to know that any more than the others. And that prevents peptide and ATP binding to TAP. So it's acting just like two of the proteins that we discussed before. ICP-47, that prevents entry into TAP, and US-6, which inhibits the ATP binding activity. So there's a very complex array of these guys. And here we have another one. Human cytomegalovirus makes another protein, US3. And for some reason, cytomegaloviruses make lots of these proteins. And we'll get to that in just a second. But this is a glycoprotein, and it interacts with tapasin. And if it's a glycoprotein, you know that it's stuck in the membrane here somewhere. And that results, again, in MHC1 heavy chain degradation. So it gets released from the beta-2 microglobulin, it gets shoved out into the cytoplasm, 
It's a wandering lost soul and it gets eaten alive by the proteasome. Now, there's another small molecule called MK3 and it's made by cytomegaloviruses and it again targets the peptide loading complex and it targets it for degradation by ubiquitination. So it spits out MHC and it interacts both with TAP and with tapasin, so it's drawn this way, and it shoves the MHC right out uh, into the proteasome. So that's how you inhibit MHC1 presentation. And as you can see, there are a variety of ways, and I haven't even discussed the fact that viruses can also inhibit uh, translation of MHC in infected cells. They can restrict transcription of MHC. So there is really more than one way to skin this cat. In terms of exogenous antigen presentation, this is the role of MHC2. MHC2 is a protein that um, aggregates, doesn't aggregate, it, it, um, it interacts with something called the invariant chain inside of these vesicles and cells and matures through the Golgi apparatus until it gets to a vesicle where the invariant chain is degraded. Once the invariant chain is degraded, MHC2 has the capacity to bind peptide. Where does the peptide come from? Well, all those cells that we're releasing and we're apoptosing and releasing protein are the uh, apoptotic bodies and the proteins get uh, endocytosed. These um, uh, bodies uh, activate the pH gets lower, proteins get proteolized, and now they become fodder for MHC2. And MHC2 binds peptide, larger proteins, and takes them to the cell surface in a very specific manner using the very specific vesicles and these get presented and recognized by CD4 cells. So I told you that um, cytomegalovirus is just a, a wonderful source for trying to understand how MHC presentation actually works. And it is because it finds a way to attack every single point within the MHC presentation pathway. There's a tegument protein. You remember what that is? That's that little space between the nucleocapsid and the envelope that inhibits the proteasome. It does it by phosphorylating. Uh, different components. US6 inhibits MHC1 translocation to the endoplasmic reticulum. It can inhibit, US3 can inhibit MHC transport across the endoplasmic reticulum. Two other proteins, 2 and 11, force MHC1 into the cytoplasm. Again, it's the lost soul effect. And UL18 is an MHC1 mimetic, so it looks just like MHC1, that downregulates NK cells and CTL cells by interacting uh, with the inhibitory receptors. So to summarize everything I know about MHC intercession, we have to think about the fact that viruses have to cope with their hosts. And for the host to succeed, viral antigens must be presented on the cell surface. For the virus to succeed, it must prevent that event from occurring. And let me just finish with one last story that just uh, came out a couple of months ago. And um, it's in interesting for a different reason. These are 300 different ways in which the immune system is modulated. But we've begun to talk about host microRNAs and how they have a role in virus replication. You heard about hepatitis C and how it needs one. Well, there's a virus called uh, herpes virus cimeri that immortalizes human T cells. So it takes normal T cells and it allows them to grow forever. And this virus expresses seven U-rich non-coding RNAs, herpes cimeria U-rich RNAs. And two of these have binding sites for three different host microRNAs. And it turns out that in these transformed cells, that in these immortalized cells, the abundance of a very specific microRNA, MIR27, is dramatically reduced. And it's a result of HSUR-directed degradation so the virus has found a way to attack uh, a host microRNA that results or partially results in this um, immortalized phenotype. So thank you, and all this stuff will be on the test on Wednesday.